Good morning, everyone. We'll start our service. Welcome to Cross Point Community Church. Um, before we begin, we will have our call to worship, and this morning's call to worship is taken from Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us. We are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Heavenly Father, uh, we lift this time up to you. May we, uh, may we be present and hear the message that you have prepared for us to hear as Pastor Nathan preaches from the book of Ezekiel. And uh, be with us now as we sing songs of worship. And uh, we pray all these things in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Indeed, we need to shout to the Lord uh, with gladness. Uh, let's all stand and let's shout to the Lord.
yes, we indeed, we want to shout to the Lord because His amazing grace, and that free us from all kinds of bondage. Next is amazing grace. such a good and gracious king. Good and gracious king.
Father God, we thank you because you are such a good and gracious king. Your amazing grace uh, free us from all the bondage. Uh, you have sent your son uh, for our sake so we can trust in him and be saved and avoid your wrath uh, or fury. And we thank you for all the things because our faith, you call us your own and your children and even your friends. We um, could not fully understand uh, the immense grace and love that you have for us, but we wanted to follow you for the rest uh, days of our life. May you continue to walk in us, help us to uh, be sanctified and follow you uh, with all our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, please be seated. Okay, good morning. And now uh, comes the time of the service where we go over some announcements. So there are a few items I wanted to bring to your attention. Um, the, first, the first item concerns um, sort of CDC guidelines, church guidelines. And uh, just to let you know that it is now mask optional. So if you feel comfortable without wearing a mask, feel free. If you w wish to wear a mask, feel free to do so. Um, uh, the next thing concerns Easter. With Easter coming up, there are uh, the children ministry wished us to announce that there for the Easter family festivities three items. Uh, the first is volunteers are needed uh, for the Easter family festivities. So if you go to cbcgl.org and to the children's ministry, you can see that there's a sign up information about signing up. So if you feel so moved to volunteer, uh, we encourage you to do so. Uh, they are also looking for um, donations of either uh, candy or money. <laughs> so that's also uh, linked there. And for those families who wish to attend, there's a link to sign up, uh, a registration link. So we point those out to you. And uh, then we'd also like to point out to you that um, there's an Alpha course coming up soon on April 26th. Um, and so Alpha is just a way to reach out and to share with others our faith in, sort of in a, a friendly and open setting. So perhaps you say, uh, you say, Paul, I have... I have all these people I want to invite to Alpha Course, but every time it comes to it, I don't, I can't remember what the start date is. I can't remember the connection, you know, how, how to connect to it. Uh, if that's the case, uh, I've got good news for you. So uh, <laughs> Marina's printed out these nice uh, postcards that have all the information. It even has a QR code. So you don't have to remember any of that. All you have to do is talk to Marina, get a few of these postcards and keep them with you, and then if you, as you encounter someone you feel might want to learn more about the gospel, you can just hand them the card and it has all the information on it. Um, so that, that's, uh, please talk to Marina about that. She has that information. Otherwise, uh, we address your attention to uh, the, the church announcements that can be found at cbcgl.org. And with that, I will turn it over to Pastor Nathan Williams. The message today is Come Alive, and he'll be preaching from the book of Ezekiel. All right, before we dive into the sermon this morning, uh, we are going to do one of our special activities. Uh, and so uh, I would like to invite Ann Sung to come up on stage. Ann, are you here? Thank you. All right. Um, so we are doing an interview today. The reason we do uh, this special activity where we do an interview is so you get to know people in our congregation uh, as well as what God's doing in their lives. So um, we're going to do a short interview and then take time to pray. All right. Uh, good morning, Ann. Good morning. Um, could you tell our congregation where it is that you work? Uh, I work at Raytheon Technology, uh, a defense manufacturing company. All right. Uh, and what is it that you do for work? Uh, I do many different work, but one of the uh, recent uh, job is uh, 
kind of like a technical liaison uh, in a uh, cross-functional team um, to solve uh, problems, particularly in uh, materials and processing. Wow. Um, so you act as a bridge builder for people building stuff. Uh, when there's a problem. Okay. <laughs> problem solving bridge builder. Excellent. Uh, and um, what, is, what is one way that you've seen God at work? Um, I want to say that, uh, you know, learning God's words mm -hmm. uh, with brothers and sisters through uh, Bible study and Sunday school uh, is very helpful and really see God's plan mm -hmm. um, is uh, very revealing. Um, I also see God's really training a team of elite soldiers there so we can do God's work very soon. Sure. Uh, we, we're working to, uh, together. Um, and then what's one way we can pray for you? Um, I want to pray, uh, you know, pray for all the youth here, um, you know, help them to lead from temptation mm -hmm. and parts of the Lord's Prayer, and, you know, um, what's the next word? Uh, Deliver us from evil. Well, part of, so, and also I want to ask to pray for the parents. Sure. Uh, and youth leaders, because mm -hmm. it was my darkest time when I raised my kids. So sure. I thought that would be a good one. Absolutely. We can pray for that. So uh, please join me as we pray. Uh, Lord God, we thank you that you are at work. Uh, thank you for Anne and the work you're doing in her and through her uh, at Raytheon, as well as here uh, and the work she's serving at church, uh, being a, a Friday night coordinator for the Bible study. Lord, I pray also that you would provide for the youth in our church, help them to walk uh, following you, um, to know you, to love you, live for you, uh, and give grace and wisdom to the parents um, who are confident, who know what's going on, but then who also are making up as they go along. I know because I'm a parent, Lord, uh, and uh, we need you, God. Um, so sustain us and strengthen us to point our children in a way that um, leads them to you. Uh, and may you deserve the glory because, Lord, you are worth it. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. All right. Can we bring up the Prezi again? Okay. It was a Sunday afternoon. He thought that he was going to die. Brace, brace, brace! The flight attendants were shouting as they were working to prepare them for impact. The pilot of the flight had announced moments earlier that the plane had experienced engine failure and that the passengers and crew needed to prepare for a crash landing. He now wished that he had paid a little more attention to the safety precautions, uh, the pamphlet that they had given before um, they had taken off. He had never really felt so out of control or actually totally exposed in his life, or to be honest, so scared. He was sitting three rows from the back of the plane in the middle seat with absolutely no ability to change anything that was about to happen. So he played through his mind the fact that in just a few minutes, a couple minutes, he could be meeting God. And if this were you, what would be running through your mind? His wife, Brittany, and he took a moment to remind each other of the answer to the first question of the catechism, what is our only hope in life and in death? And they spoke the words back and forth to each other, I am not my own, but belong body and soul, both in life and in death, to God and to my Savior, Jesus Christ. He asked his wife, did you do anything for God to save you? And Brittany answered, nothing, absolutely nothing. Christ did it all. The people around them were weeping, knees to their chest. In a moment, uh, he had turned his attention to the young woman sitting on his right. They had exchanged some polite conversation, as many people do before takeoff, but now she was sobbing, curled up into a brace position, and he leaned toward her and asked, if, if we die in the next few minutes, do you know what's going to happen? She said something about growing up Catholic, going to purgatory or heaven or something. She wasn't sure. And he said, I'm glad to share with you why my wife and I have hope right now. I, I hope that's okay. 
She said it was, and so he started preaching to a larger group in the rows around them just over the sound of the plane which had experienced engine failure. He said, I don't want to scare anyone, but I want you to know why my wife and I have hope right now. We have peace with God. A few heads turned and looked at him, and he continued, the God who made everything wants to make peace with us even though we have broken his world. He loves us so much that he left heaven to make peace with sinners by dying on a cross. His name is Jesus. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is risen Lord and you will have peace with God. Nobody scoffed. Nobody laughed. They passed through the cloud line. The ground was getting closer. He saw trees. Closer. More trees. In what seemed like a split second and an eternity in the same moment, somehow there was suddenly a runway beneath the plane. They glided onto the tarmac. Hollering, clapping, cheering, crying. They landed with no loss of life or injury. They even got $12 meal vouchers for the airport as they waited for the next plane to arrive. Not bad. Turns out, uh, as pa- Pastor Kyle Don found out from, later from some pilot friends, that they weren't really in too much danger from single engine failure. Pilots are trained to fly on a single engine in an emergency. But that moment that he had lived through exposed what he had been hoping in or who he was trusting. And if it had been you, what would you have been doing? Think about it. What or who are you hoping in? What carries you or what are you trusting to presently carry you through hopeless situations? We are in our final sermon in our series through Ezekiel. This morning we end in what is arguably the most recognizable portion of the whole book of Ezekiel. Even if you've never read the Bible before, you've perhaps heard songs like Lauren Daigle's Come Alive. It says, We cry out to dry bones, come alive, come alive. Right? Or maybe you've heard the old spiritual dem bones. Dem bones, dem bones, dem dry bones, dem bones, dem bones, dem dry bones, dem bones, dem bones, dem dry bones. Now hear the word of the Lord. These both songs are are written based on our passage for this morning. So if you do not have it, I want to let you know we are in Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 to 14. This passage was originally a message given to Israelites living in exile in Babylon. They had lost hope. And after over 10 years of having been displaced in a foreign land due to the invading army of Babylon, and after hearing news of Jerusalem's destruction, they had lost all hope. But God had not given up on them. So turn in your Bible to Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 to 14. If you're using the Bible found in front of you, some, there are some Bibles in the rows in front of you. You can find it on pages 20, uh, 724 or 725. Um, As we consider what the Lord had to say to them, we will also learn what God has to say to us today. So please do open your Bibles and follow along as I read. Get beyond whatever you're doing on your phone and turn to the Bible. Chapter 37, verses 1 to 14. God's Word says this, The hand of the Lord was upon me, Ezekiel speaking, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord, and he set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. And you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there, was, there were sinews on them. And flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. 
So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet in an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you up from your graves, O my people, and I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. And then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we go through this passage this morning together, we will see that God promises restoration in verses 1 to 6. God restores life in verses 7 to to 10, and then God restores hope in verses 11 to 14. So let's look first at the the first six verses uh, where God promises restoration. God promises to come to the people of Israel through a vision given to the prophet Ezekiel. This type of vision is different from other visions in Ezekiel, the ones that he had had, as seen in the phrase, the hand of the Lord was on me. One commentator notes that this expression is used to indicate a more intense experience where the prophet is affected physically. It is used in all the great visual oracles um, in Ezekiel, where Ezekiel feels himself transported within the vision himself. He feels himself transported to another place ready to be in a, like another time to experience something that God has for him. And so the place where the Lord had transported him was to a valley, or if you look in your footnotes, it says a plain. That could be the word valley or plain, the same possible translation. It doesn't really matter much what the place is as much as what Ezekiel sees in the place. The ground is literally covered with bones. They hadn't been buried or collected into ossuaries. See, Jewish cultural practice um, dictated burial uh, and then a moving of the bones into something like ossuaries. Jewish burial practice still dictates physical burial and not cremation, things like that today, um, because uh, they want to be able to have a physical body for resurrection. Um, But the bones here in this vision had experienced no such care. Two things are noted about these bones. Behold, they are very many, and they are very dry. The scattering of of dry bones over the ground suggests that there had been a battle, but no one had come to bury the dead. This kind of disgrace God had warned them of in the Mosaic Covenant. If they had disobeyed the word of the Lord, their bones would be scattered over the earth. In one of Ezekiel's visions from chapter 6, Ezekiel saw God laying out the dead bodies of the people of Israel before their idols and scattering their bones around the altars. But the image here in chapter 37 represents not just judgment from chapter 6, but also that covenantal curse, which included judgment that the whole house of Israel had experienced, as one commentator notes, including even those who'd been exiled by the Assyrians some 130 years earlier. So there's this judgment of exile And that's what these bones are signifying. So following this tour of bones, in in verse 3, God asks Ezekiel, can these bones live? The question is one of possibility. Can these bones live? Is it possible for these bones to live? Ezekiel knows that these bones are good and dead. But Ezekiel doesn't focus on the situation of the bones. Instead, he turns his attention to the Lord. Note his response. He says, O Lord God, Well, you know. Ezekiel's focus is on the Lord and the Lord's knowledge and ability. How many of our problems would be solved if we would follow Ezekiel's example and we shifted our focus to the Lord instead of facing our problems that we see? I'm not saying we ignore all problems. I'm saying that in the midst of our problems, we face the Lord. Wouldn't anxieties and worries be diminished, maybe even dissolve? Wouldn't impossibilities be transformed into possibilities? Wouldn't we be encouraged as we see God do his work? 
we take our focus off of the problems that we have and turn to the Lord in the midst of our problems. So when Ezekiel answers, O Lord God, you know, that's when Ezekiel's own words are ended in this passage. That's the last thing that he says that comes from him. In fact, it's the only thing he says in this passage that comes from him. Oh, Lord God, you know. After this, Ezekiel speaking the word of the Lord at the command of the Lord. Look at verse 4. God tells Ezekiel to speak to the bones as if they had ears. He says, Oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Obey the word of the Lord. And what do these bones do? They are to come alive at the word of the Lord. If you look at verse 5, you see God says, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. A quick aside on the word breath here in our passage. One commentator explains that its word ruach, which is the word for breath, denotes a sense of air in motion, i.e. wind or breath. This can extend from a gentle breeze to a stormy wind or from a breath that is breathed to a raging passion. It comes to to mean both man's spirit or disposition and also emotional qualities like vigor or courage, impatience or ecstasy. It covers not only man's vital breath giving him, given to him at birth and leaving his body in a dying gasp, but also the Spirit of God who imparts such breath. Such is the rich variety of the word that's used here by God to Ezekiel. Speak to the breath, the wind, the Spirit. So every word in our passage that is breath or wind or spirit is a reference to the same thing. So how will these bones live? God explains in verse 6 that all that he will do, take note, God says, I will, the Lord says, I will lay sinews upon you. I will cause flesh to come upon you and I will cover you with skin and I will put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. Friends, the bones don't give themselves life. It doesn't work that way. Dead things don't give themselves life. This only comes by the gracious work of God. And praise God that he's the one who keeps his promises. God had promised in verses 1 to 6 that he would bring restoration. And now in verses 7 to 10, God fulfills his promise through the preaching of Ezekiel. Look now at verses 7 to 10. Ezekiel obeys God's command and he prophesies to the bones. Can you see it in your imagination? Just think, you can close your eyes and imagine Ezekiel standing in this field or valley surrounded by bones bleached white by the sun and he's speaking to them. He speaks God's word to dead bones. Now this isn't the oddest thing that he's ever done in the book, but it is a remarkable thing. His prophesying to the bones is an act of trust, an act of obedience, an act that carries the power of God. As Ezekiel is preaching to these bones, they start to move. Bones find the bones to which they had been connected and they rattle as they come together. Then sinews form on the bones, the things that connect the bones together. Then flesh grows over the sinew and finally skin covers the flesh. These once scattered bones are now human corpses all over the ground because there was no life in them. We get a glimpse of this kind of thing when we attend funerals or wakes. Uh, And we see before us, maybe at an open casket, that there is a human body which is there lifeless. That's the kind of thing that Ezekiel saw in his vision. Lifeless bodies all around him. And now, surely a miracle had happened. There had been bones before, and now they're bodies. But this miracle wasn't complete, and that's why Ezekiel notes at the end of verse 8, but there was no breath in them. So God again speaks to Ezekiel and commands him to prophesy, not to dead bones, but to the life-giving breath or spirit of God. Look at verse uh, 8 and 9. Ezekiel is told to prophesy to the breath. The breath is to come from the four winds and breathe on these slain. The four winds are a poetic allusion to the four corners of the earth. Not that the earth is flat and has corners. Sorry, flat earthers. It just isn't real. Um... Instead, this is a poetic allusion to the universal sovereignty of God. You see, God is not merely a God of Israel and one nation. He is the God over all the earth. The Lord is the Lord God over all the earth. God's presence is in all of the earth. 
God is sovereign over all of it. He made it. We are his. God, God speaks to Ezekiel, says, prophesy to the breath. And so Ezekiel again obeys God's command and this time prophesies to the breath. He is speaking to the breath or the spirit of God. One commentator notes that this is, well, comparable to praying. Ezekiel, at God's command, sought the Spirit of God to bring about the miracle of resurrection life or a new creation by breathing into these slain so that they would live. So look at verse 10. As Ezekiel prophesied, the breath came into them and they lived. They lived. This is an allusion to Genesis chapter 2 where God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. So too, God can give life to those who are dead. God can restore life. No one was beyond God's hope or help. As the notes of the Gospel Transformation Bible indicate, God wants Ezekiel and the whole nation of Israel to know that it is his word that brings life. God's word is the one that brings life. In the most hopeless of situations, even in a valley full of death, God's word is powerful enough to bring resurrection life. And had then, these people lived, and they stood on their feet in an exceedingly great army. See, God had promised restoration. And then God restored life to these lifeless bones, fulfilling his promise, making them into bodies, and then filling those bodies with breath, giving them life. In the final verses of our passage, God restores hope to Israel and to us. Look at Ezekiel 37, verses 11 to 14. In these verses, God basically interprets the vision for Ezekiel, a precursor to the explanations of the parables that Jesus gave to his disciples. It's like, what does this mean? Well, God tells him, these bones are the house of Israel. This means that it was both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom They had both expressed hopelessness caused by exile. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. But even if they had felt as if they were as good as dead, God was not done with them. Okay, Our God keeps his promises, even to his people Israel. God told Ezekiel to share this message of God's work to God's hopeless people. And listen again to note that all God will do in verses 12 and 13. God says, I will open your graves and I will bring you into the land of Israel. When God says he will open their graves, he is saying that he will open up the possibility of their return from exile because their going into exile had been like they had been buried, that they had lost their life that they had had before. But God promises to bring them out of exile and bring them into the land of Israel. God continues, he says, You shall know that I am the Lord when I open up your graves and I will raise you from your graves, O my people Israel. For God to raise his people from the dead means that God is going to return them from exile, bringing them to their own land as he had promised uh, from in the previous chapter, which we heard about in Ezekiel chapter 36. The imagery here is one of resurrection, though it does not explicitly point to the future hope of individual resurrection that we all have. Um, today, there are other Old Testament passages that do that more directly. After God, uh, after God brings them out of exile, he will put his breath, his spirit into them, and they will live. And God will place them in their own land. And when this restoration happens, they will know that God is the Lord, the one and only sovereign, the ruler of the universe. In these final four verses, God shows his people that he provides hope for the hopeless, just as he provides life for the lifeless. My hope this morning is that you hear God speaking the same truth to you this morning. God provides hope for the hopeless just as he provides life for the lifeless. God can provide hope for the hopeless just as he provides life for the lifeless. This morning, some of you here do not have spiritual life. But you can. Perhaps you've seen God at work in the lives of others to change others, to help people to become more patient or kind or generous, but you haven't seen those changes in your own life. And if this describes you, consider what is it that you are putting your hope in? What is it that you're trusting? 
Think back to the beginning of this message. If you had been on that plane that Sunday afternoon, what would you be hoping in? The reason that that pastor and his wife had had hope is because they were hoping in the Lord Jesus Christ. They were Christians. Are you? Friends, one main concern that I have is that you will grow, go to church, you'll grow up going to church, and, and you're not a Christian. You haven't accepted the truth of what God has done for you, and so you misunderstand Christianity. Perhaps you've come this morning and you think that Christianity is a good thing, but it's just not for you. So I don't want you to misunderstand. Okay? Maybe you need to correct your misunderstandings about Christianity. After all, you're not a completely horrible person. Maybe you've said some bad stuff, you've done some bad stuff that hurts some people and others. So why is it you need to become a Christian? Well, let me be clear on this point. Christianity isn't about making bad people into good people. Christianity isn't about scoring enough positive points to offset negative points, to make the balances kind of weigh out before God. It doesn't work like that. Christianity isn't about doing more or trying harder. Christianity isn't about making bad people into good people. It is about making dead people come alive. Those who are dead in their sins and rebelling against God, who have no spiritual life in them. People who recognize this understand that there has to be a heart transplant of sorts removing from us our hearts of stone and giving us hearts of flesh. There has to be the Spirit of God breathing new life into us. But how does that happen? How does that come about? It happens as we confess and believe the gospel. There's no other way. See, the gospel is good news. That's what the word gospel means. It's the good news that we can have life through the work that God has done. You see, God made the world and everything in it. He even formed Adam and Eve from the dust and from a human bone. So you think, God's doing a work of making humans out of bones? God did that before. Right? And he gave them life. He gave them rules to follow, not in a way to gain acceptance with him, be like, oh, do this, do this, do this, and then you can come into my presence, but good rules so they could enjoy God and his creation. They could enjoy relationship with God. But they believed the lie of Satan and they doubted the goodness of God. They rebelled against God's good command and sin entered the world warping, dividing, destroying the good things that God has made. The Bible says that the result of sin is death, spiritual death, so that we are like spiritual zombies, walking dead. We are dead in our sins apart from Jesus Christ. But when Christ came, he lived a perfect life and died in our place as a substitutionary atonement, doing what's necessary to make us at one with God, to make us right with God. Just as those bones in Ezekiel's day didn't do anything to receive life, so too we don't do anything to earn salvation. Those bones were enabled to hear, enabled to obey, and given life. So too we are enabled to hear the call of God and repent and believe the gospel. Then... When we put our trust in Jesus to rescue us from sin and death, we come alive by the Spirit of God upon whom we continue to rely. It's not like we come alive and then we're like, okay, now I got this, God. I'll do this on my own. No, we keep depending on God. Because God doesn't promise us new life. Uh, he doesn't promise this new life to everybody. Yes, it's available to everybody. Absolutely. Absolutely. But if you read God's word, you see not all people will be saved. This promise is for all, this promise of new life is to all who put their trust in Jesus. As we turn from our sinful, selfish, self centered ways and place our faith, our trust in Jesus, we are swept into the new life of salvation, the abundant life of the Spirit. See, if you've never put your faith in Jesus, friends, you this morning are dead in your sins. So now hear the word of the Lord. Repent and believe the good news. That's what Jesus said this morning. If you're not a Christian, but you, maybe you want to be, you can put your trust in Jesus to save you and make you come alive. For those who have already come alive, for those of us who are Christians, we need to recognize that when life seems hopeless, 
when the things around us seem hopeless. Man, when will when this pandemic ever go away? When will I ever get into the college of my choice? When will Russia ever stop invading Ukraine? When will this? When will this? Where's the hope in this world? When things seem hopeless, we must turn to the Lord. We must. Christians are never without hope in this world, even in the most hopeless of situations. Some of you here probably realize that. This is because the same God who who gives life to the lifeless gives hope to the hopeless. Maybe you're here this morning and you feel like your life is scattered, but praise God that he's in the business of restoration. God knows how to piece your life back together. Even when things seem scattered and disorganized, out of control, God knows what to do. God knows how to piece your life back together. God can even bring something good out of the seeming evil that you've been living through. Because God is that good. And it's so good it has to be true. Christian hope is undying. Christian hope is undying. Not even death can remove the hope of a Christian because we are placing our trust in God who's in the business of giving life to the dead. We're putting our trust in Jesus who knows what it's like to die and has been raised from the dead to give us life. Not even temptation or sin can take away our hope. Our God can bring restoration and renewal to places and events in our life that we have given up as hopeless. Friends, family members were like, you know what? Hopeless. They're not. No one is beyond the grace of God. No one is. As one author writes, whether it's a long struggle with sin or broken relationships or even hard affliction, life circumstances can often blind us to God's life-giving power. That's why we, when we see all the, the scatteredness around us and we just look at it and be like, God's like, can these bones live? We're like, ah, look at all the bones. No, God says, look at me. The vision of the dry bones should remind us that our God truly is in the business of giving life where everything seems hopelessly dead. Our God is the God who brings hope to the hopeless just as surely as he brings life to the lifeless. Do you know that God this morning? Do you know our God this morning? Are you trusting him to help you in these hopeless situations? Because he can. Not only is he able, he is willing. If you will turn to him, say, God, help me. God, fix this. God, do something. Finally, and this may seem like a non sequitur, something that's not related, but this is, is not a non sequitur. Okay? We who love our risen Lord need to recognize that revival is built on the word of God and prayer. Ezekiel spoke God's word and miracles happened. But it's when he spoke to the Spirit, the breath of God, that those corpses received life. So too, we will, ex- we will not experience the work of God apart from the proclamation of the Word of God and dependence on the Spirit of God through prayer. Let me state this plainly. We can plan for outreach all we want. And we should plan. We should prepare. We should work. Yes, But our plans, our advertising, and our efforts are all for naught if the Spirit of God doesn't move in people's lives. We can announce things like Alpha or the open house that's coming on June 18th or VBS this summer. We can announce all these things until we are blue in the face, out of breath, frustrated at the seeming lack of response. What we need to do is rely and depend on the Spirit of God to be at work, bringing people to life. Because last I checked, that's something that neither you nor I can do. It's something that God alone does. So how do we depend on the Spirit of God? We do so through prayer. We must pray. Matthew Henry rightly notes, God's grace can save souls without our preaching, but our preaching cannot save souls without God's grace. And that grace must be sought through prayer. So as we seek 
to see our church theme this year, Revive Us Again, fulfilled, as we seek to see that fulfilled, are you depending on the Spirit of God to bring it about? Our God is the Lord of revival. He revives us by bringing life to the lifeless and hope to the hopeless. Trust Him to do His work. Then join Him in what He is doing. May all praise be given to our hope-giving, evil-reversing, life-giving God. Amen? Amen. Nathan for a great message, Father Dry Bones. Especially, our God is the God uh, provide life and hope, and He is the one that is uh, giving us the source of the, our grace and and the revival. And as you provide those things, if you're willing to take it, whatever seek shall find, and we. We respond with uh, the hymn, uh, Jesus Strong and Kind. Uh, let's stand.
Please receive God's blessing from Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Amen. Please join us as we sing the doxology.